Okay, so today what I want to talk about are a couple of things that are really um, exciting in computer vision over the past, like, you know, I guess, I guess by now it's been like five, ten years, but um, they have to do with basically changing the contents of an image in a way that you can't get by simply resizing it. And so the first observation is that, you know, sometimes we need to change the size of an image, right? I have to do that all the time. If I want to put an image on my web page, for example, I need to, you know, go into Photoshop or go into MATLAB and resize the image. And depending on how much space I have to work with in the place that I'm putting the image, the result may not look exactly like I want. So one example of that is, um, whoops, I guess I have to go to my uh, guy here. Okay, so here are my cows again, right? And so let's suppose that what I want to do is, um, how do I get rid of this tools thing? No, okay. So suppose I want to resize, this. this is like a basically a 1280 by 900 image. And suppose I want to resize this to be like a 640 by 640 image, and a square thing to put on my web page, right? So if I were to just kind of crop out, you know, try and crop this image to 640 by 640 to try and take the most interesting stuff in that image, what I would get would be, you know, maybe this would be the best crop that I could make, right? But I can see this is not a very good representation of the original because I've lost these other two cows, right? So, you know, if I wanted to try and get all the content into the image at once, what I might try and do is just kind of totally, you know, resize, take all those 1024 pixels and squeeze them into 640 and, and the same for the other dimension. If I do that, I get everything that was in the image, but now these cows look artificially skinny, right? These are not like the way that cows should actually look. And so then what I could say is, okay, well, I do the solution that you see on DVDs and Blu-rays, which is that I letterbox the image, you know, down to the right aspect ratio by putting these black bars on here. And so, you know, by the time I've done this, you can see that I've lost a lot of real estate and, and the image, you know, you could imagine I could do a better job with this image than squeezing it down and letterboxing it, right? And so this was uh, the idea behind several papers that came out uh, about how do I resize an image, preserving the content of the image, but not necessarily taking every pixel of the original, okay? And so kind of the first idea uh, along this line, I would call, um, you know, so basically the, the premise is how to resize an image while uh, doing a good job of preserving its content. So the first idea, right, is instead of just simply, uh, you know, uniformly squeezing the image down into whatever box I have to put it in, what if instead I tried to squeeze places that were um, less perceptually important more than places that were perceptually important, right? So the idea is that, you know, places like a broad expanse of sky, maybe I can just get away with squeezing out that sky, whereas if there's a person in the picture, I want to make sure that I keep that person's face, you know, as good as, as, as you know, close to the original aspect ratio as possible, right? So I don't want to distort stuff that is perceptually important, but I can get away with stuff that is, you know, flat or bland or repetitive, right? So kind of the first, the simplest idea would be something like uh, what I would say is non-uniform warping based on a region of interest. And sometimes you see that called an ROI. And so what do I mean by that? Well, so suppose this is the image I want to retarget, okay? So what I could do is I could draw a box around the thing that I cared the most about, right? So I'd say, okay, well here, the meerkat, right, is the thing that I obviously want to preserve. The rest of the image, you know, is nice, but I don't really care so much about it. And so what I could do is I could say, okay, if I want to change this into a new image uh, aspect ratio, what I'll do is I'll keep everything inside the box to look basically the same as it does now. Maybe I will, you know, stretch or shrink this box uniformly, but I won't change the aspect ratio of the stuff that's inside there. And then the other eight boxes that surround the middle, I'm just going to squeeze those, you know, um, you know, non-uniformly, right? So the idea being, I go from this, 
to this. Where now, what I've done is I've said, okay, if you notice, this top box here has gone from being a little bit taller than the meerkat to a lot shorter than the meerkat, right? And the same, basically the whole top third of the image has been really squeezed down. And also, you know, I've proportionally squeezed the left and the right as well. And if I remove the bars, you, know, you might look at this and say, okay, well, you know, this could be worse, right? I mean, you would definitely say that there's some sort of maybe weird distortion around the grassy area, but, you know, on a first look, you, know, you might look at this and say, okay, well, this is all right. I mean, this would probably be better than trying to squeeze the entire image down to the size of this box of letterboxing it, right? And this is a very simple idea. So all you have to do is you draw the box and then you um, squeeze the rest of the image surroundings down to fit, you know, once you've centered the box where you want it, right? So that's pretty straightforward. Um, but this requires the user to actually draw the box, right? Which is not the end of the world. But what you could do is you could say, okay, what if I could automatically find the most important stuff without having to have the user go in and manually draw the box? So there's been a lot of work on that idea. And so uh, one of the key words in the research area is called saliency. And the idea is that you have an automatic algorithm that takes an image as input and kind of gives you a grayscale or a binary map saying, this is where the human eye will find the most important stuff. And so, um, you know, there are definitely things that the human eye looks out for. We're very sensitive to edges in the image, we're sensitive to faces, and so you can build a detector that kind of agglomerates a whole bunch of these, um, you know, observed uh, rules for what the humans look for and build it into a map like this. So here's an example of a, of a scene and an automatic salience detector processing this image will come up with this, right? And so, you know, you might say, okay, well, what, what is this picking up on? It's picking up on the dark to light contrast in this doorway. It's picking up on the dark to light contrast of this skull. Oops, sorry. So, and it's picking up generally on the most edgy stuff that you can see, right? And again, this is, you know, just one example. You could also have a detector like the thing that's in your digital camera that picks up on faces. So I don't want to go into the way that these detectors work too much, but all this to say is that, you know, you can basically take off the shelf something that will give you the best estimate of what's important, right? And then you could say, okay, given a map like this, what I should do is I should, you know, not squeeze stuff that's in these bright white regions because that's the important stuff. And the other regions that are not so important, I can get away with squeezing those um, a little bit more. And so um, here's an example. This is a uh, algorithm called optimized scale and stretch. And so there's actually a, uh, let's see, is this it? No. This is it. Okay, so this is the uh, nice interface provided by Wang et al. who originally did this. And so the idea is that I load an image I thought I loaded that image. Thinking, not responding. Okay, so then what I want to do is I want to resize this image. Let me just make this a little bit smaller. And so what you're going to see is that as I uh, kind of hover over it, you see there are these pink lines. And I think that there's a way to... Uh, well, I guess, I guess here's, here's exactly an example, right? So I want to squeeze this image down to something you guys can see on my screen, right? It's too big for the laptop screen right now. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to grab the corner of this, and I believe that I'm going to right click and just kind of drag it to be smaller. So what did I do? Well, actually, I did make this image smaller, right? I think I'm making it smaller, not just resizing it. Well, maybe I'm just resizing it. Oh, okay, yeah, here we go. So here what I'm doing is I'm pressing the control button and I'm dragging this image around. And so now I can pretty much put the whole thing on here. I think I have to drag it from the bottom. Once I get this thing kind of on my screen, then we'll see what happened. Okay, so now here's, a, here's an image that again, if you look at this, you probably wouldn't necessarily notice anything was up. But if I press this, you can kind of see the grid that corresponds to what the automatic saliency detector has figured out are important regions or not. And you can see that the you know, regions in the sky, for example, have been squeezed down to be you know, a lot smaller proportionally than they originally were, right? Whereas if this was a uniform resizing, I would expect everything to just be a square, right? Because I start with a square grid, and in theory, when I resize uniformly, everything else should be little squares. But these, these things are definitely not all square. And if I look at the uh, significance, so significance here 
is kind of like a measure of the automatic estimate of how important different regions of the image are, right? And so you can see this algorithm has said, okay, well, what's important? All the stuff on the left-hand side is important. There's a person over here. There's a bunch of seaweed and junk. There's a strong line between the uh, water and the uh, kind of horizon in the mountains. That's important. But all this other stuff, this light blue stuff, really is not as important. And so, um, let me turn off the grid here. And so I can kind of see as I squish this around, you know, as I squeeze it to the extreme, you can kind of see that the Pearson and the seaweed and stuff, this stuff is still kind of getting preserved, whereas the beach has been really kind of squeezed down and the sky has been really squeezed down. And of course, this is kind of like the extreme case. I mean, like you don't usually want to squeeze something down quite this much. I can kind of pull it back up again. I can make this a square image, right? So now you can see if I do this to make it square, the sky has been kind of like squeezed this way to make room for making the image into a square, right? And so as you can see, this is a real-time interactive thing. And you might argue with whether the saliency map does what you want, but actually it works pretty well. And so this is definitely an immediately better thing than just simply, you know, uh, uniformly rescaling the image, okay? All right, so that's the first idea of the day. So any questions about that? Yeah? If you, I don't know if they did any like, user studies on this or not, but mm -hmm. if you just show people an image which has been resized, right. can, can people immediately tell? Can people tell it's been resized? So that's a good question. So there have been, along with the stuff I'm going to talk about next, there have been a lot of user studies about like, if a image has been resized using one of different ways, there have been lots of user studies on what users prefer, right? Do they like just totally uniformly scaled? Do they like this method? Do they like something else? Uh, in terms of user studies, it's just like a straight yes or no, has this image been modified? In this context, I'm not sure. I mean, I'm sure there have been such studies because, for example, there's a lot of stuff in like digital forensics, right, of, you know, is this an original image or not, right? So there's been a lot of work on can people tell whether something's been modified or not. In the, in the sense of retargeting, I'm not sure there's been like straight yes or no studies, but I'm sure there have been studies like that in other fields, yeah. But yes, there, there, there definitely was one big comparison study over lots of different retargeting applications. So let me just back up and say, so retargeting is a word that you hear a lot in this literature. And so that is kind of a word that has been claimed by the vision and graphics community to distinguish this, tech, this, this class of techniques from what you call resizing, right? So retargeting has this connotation that you are not treating every pixel equally, that you are actually changing the aspect ratios of pixels or moving entire pixels, stuff like that. So retargeting is kind of like a more generic or more general uh, word than resizing. Wasn't, um, wasn't there an example where it would also not necessarily keep the grid um, sort of the Yes, of the so we're gonna, we're gonna come back to that about like, so it's true that all these images so far I've showed you look pretty good, um, but we're going to see how some of these images break down in just a second, right? Okay. So let me just ask, so the next thing I want to talk about is called seam carving. Have you guys heard of seam carving at all? Yes? No? Yes. Okay. So seam carving is like probably one of the things that when, when this came on the scene, suddenly like everyone was emailing a YouTube video to each other. It was like suddenly this very cool thing. And so that idea is again, very simple to explain and very simple um, to understand. So let me talk about that. So. The idea behind um, seam carving is the following. So let's continue the theme of trying to, you know, trying to preferentially get rid of pixels that are not really important to the image, right? And so the observation behind seam carving was the following. Suppose I want to change this image into this image, right? Now, the most naive thing that I could do would be to say, okay, I'm going to take the column of the image that is the least important column, right? It has the lowest energy. So I'm going to talk about what I mean by energy in just a second, right? So you can imagine this, if this column cut through like an empty white wall, then that would be a great candidate to remove because no one would notice if it was gone, right? If I remove this column, then this image here would be one, you know, it would be one pixel less wide, right? And if I wanted to keep on reducing the width of the image, I can just keep on removing these low energy columns, right? So that idea is okay, except that, you know, the column, as I remove these columns, the, the image is gonna look pretty weird, right? But 
the observation was that actually I can also reduce the image pixel width by one unit if I remove a line through the image that looks like this, right? So as long as I've only got one pixel per row, then if I remove that one pixel per row, I'm overall reducing the image width by one pixel, right? And so this means that this is like a more general case than that, right? This basically says that find me the lowest cost path that goes from the top to the bottom of the image and then remove the pixels along that path, right? And this we call a seam, okay? And so really, so, and, and if I wanted to reduce the uh, height of the image, what I could do is I could say, okay, if I want to turn this tall image into a square image, well, in that case, I could find, you know, seams that go the other way. And if I wanted to resize the entire image, what I could do is I could kind of alternate removing horizontal seams and vertical seams, right, until I've reduced the image down to the size that I want, okay? Um, and so kind of here's just a picture of, here's an original image. Oh, sorry, this is the scale and stretch thing again. So here's the original image. Here is what turns out to be the lowest cost top to bottom scheme. You can see it passes through basically empty sky, empty sand, and not too many of the edges of the mountains and stuff. And here is the lowest cost left to right scheme, seam. And again, that passes through basically just empty sky, right? So if I were to remove those seams, I would get images that were a little bit smaller. And so the first question is, well, how do I kind of quantify what this lowest cost seam is? Well, the idea is that I should not be removing pixels that are on edges, right? So I want to remove pixels that are going through blank regions. And so it's very easy to simply quantify that. Let's see, I'm going to close this couple windows here because I have like a zillion windows open. Let's see. I don't need this guy. And I'm going to come back to this guy. This is the scene carving. OK. Sorry. OK, so basically um, measuring seam energy. So again, the setup is I want to know how much does a seam like this cost me to remove? Well, what I can do is I can say, okay, so for every you know pixel on the seam, so let's call this x y. What I can say is that the uh, energy of a of a candidate seam is the sum of along all the pixels that I'm proposing to remove, the basically This is just one possibility. The sum of the gradients, right? So this is like saying, just tell me, you know, I take the x derivative and the y derivative, and you know, a good seam, all those derivatives as I add up along the seam should be small numbers, right? Now there are lots of possibilities for changing this to be something else. I could look at the, you know, Instead, this is what you call the L1 norm of the gradient, right? The sum of the two absolute values. If I wanted to take the you know, square of those two things and take the square root, that would be the L2 norm. I take the maximum of these things, that's the L infinity norm. Any of those things would be fine, right? This is just a candidate possibility, okay? And then how do I actually find the lowest cost seam, right? Um, so for that, what I could use is dynamic programming. So has anyone ever heard of dynamic programming? I see a bunch of nods in the room here, right? So that's, that's an algorithms kind of thing, right? So, algorithm, so algorithms will teach you how to automatically compute this lowest cost thing, right? And just as a reminder, how does that work, right? So what I would do is I would make a graph and at every point in the graph, I would say, okay, so, you know, w one thing that I want to say about seams is that to make sure that there is still some sort of spatial coherence to the image. I mean, it's also true that I could just remove any arbitrary pixel per row and look at the sum of those, you know, energies. But that would kind of be a little bit, you know, weird because that would be not, ha that, that would definitely make the resulting squeezed image look pretty strange. I was just taking a random set of pixels out of every row without any no notion of the fact that the pixels I'm removing should be somehow contiguous, right? So one of the rules we put on scene carving is that you know, if I'm going to choose uh, this pixel here to be on the seam, then basically 
these are my only options for the other pixel, right? I can't just jump over to some other random pixel, okay? And that means that the dynamic programming is very simple because I ask, okay, so for example, how could I have gotten to this pixel here? I just have to look at the lowest cost coming from this direction or this direction or this direction. So really the problem that I'm setting up in dynamic programming is pretty simple. It kind of looks like this, where here, this is, if I'm kind of starting from the bottom, this is like the first row of the image and the top is the last row of the image, then for this guy here, I only really need to consider how much would it cost me to come from either of these three neighbors. So pretty easy to train the crank by dynamic programming. And so the result is, um, well, let's look at the results. I guess I actually should stay with my PDF. So here, for example, are pictures of the lowest cost seams ranked from first to however many I asked for, maybe a couple hundred, right? So these seams, you know, as you can see, they generally cut through big empty regions of the sky, empty regions of sand. They try and avoid edgy regions, right? So for example, here in this place with the guy and the sand, there are no seams that are going through that area, right? So that's saying that that stuff will be preserved in the ultimate uh, image. When I remove those seams, what I get is this square image, which again, you know, you look at it, you say, okay, well, this looks okay, right? Question. Which form did you use for that? Was it? Which, which form did you use for? I think I just used the regular L1 norm, right? And again, there have been, like the person who wrote the original scene card paper, those people looked at what was the best norm that they felt gave them the most perceptually useful results. I can kind of turn it around and I can say, okay, if I want to expand an image, right? So say I want to create stuff that wasn't there before, right? So instead of removing pixels, how could I make an image bigger? Well, the idea is the same, right? So what I could do is I could say, okay, um, so basically reducing image size means remove, you know, low cost seams. To increase the image size, I basically add pixels between low cost seams. That is, I say, okay, you know, if I want to make this image into this image, big square image, well, what I could do is I could find the lowest cost seam here, and then I could basically stick one row of pixels in between that low cost seam just by simply interpolating the pixel colors on either side and filling in a color that's in the middle, right? When I do that, I make the image one pixel wider, right? And if I keep on doing that, I make the image as many pixels wider as I want. And there's a little bit of bookkeeping that I have to kind of think about, you know, I should find the lowest cost seams, um, you know, prior to starting to fill in the middle, because if I keep on filling in here, I'm always going to end up filling in the same seam. I don't want to do that. I want to keep on filling in a bunch of different seams. But if I look at the results of that, here again is an original image. Here are the lowest cost seams. Again, generally passing through blank regions of the image where I'm not going to notice anything that's going on. And when I fatten the image up, I get this image. Now again, this, this image is not like, you know, you might look at this and think that the things are a little bit weird. But like, for example, the frog here, nothing went through the frog. So the frog actually looks pretty good because nothing has changed there. The shapes of the leaves have gotten a little bit stranger. But again, I mean, if you saw this, and I didn't tell you anything about it, you might not think that anything was, was wrong. And again, if you look at the original um, seam carving video, which I think I still have pulled up here. So the original seam carving video kind of showed that a nice interactive thing where you could basically just grab a corner and you could see the seams being interpolated on the fly. And so the, if you watch this whole video, there's some pretty neat um, effects where basically you could imagine that if you were resizing a web page, the text in your browser dynamically resizes. You could imagine that your image, the, all the images on a web page could also dynamically resize. And this is just details about showing how they compute the, the lowest cost seams. So again, this is just kind of like uh, showing what you could do with a column versus a scene that cut from top to bottom without, um, so let me go back to kind of the end here. So the idea here is, oh no, unavailable. So let me, let me go back to this for a second. So this kind of is talking about, you know, um, 
different energy costs you could use. One thing that you can do with seam carving is you can say, okay, so I want to make sure that I don't pass the seams through a really perceptually important part of the image, which is usually going to be accomplished by this energy criterion, but you might screw up sometimes. So here's an example where, you know, if you're doing a portrait, if you just do it naively, you get this uh, squished baby head. <laughs> so instead you might say, okay, what I want to do is I want to protect these regions, right? I have the user kind of draw and say, look, you could never pass seams through this region. These areas have infinitely high weight. That way, when you resize the image, no seams will ever pass through that region and you get a result that looks good. And kind of conversely, you could use seam carving for in-painting, right? The idea that there would be, you say, okay, now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take the region that I would normally call the in-painting region and I'm gonna make that region zero cost to pass through. So basically, those are the first to go and you force the seams to pass through that region so that all that stuff that you want to get rid of gets chipped away, no matter what stuff was originally there. And then if you wanted to be really tricky, you could, you know, so say I wanted to remove this object, say I needed to remove 100 seams to get it totally away, then I could expand the image by 100 seams so that I had an image that was the same size as the original that would be basically like the original without the stuff that I wanted to remove. And so here, they're gonna show a couple examples of this. So here, this is again saying, you could do this with an automatic face detector. Here, this is like the in-painting. So you say, okay, I wanna remove these people from the beach. Here, you're forcing the seams to pass through these regions, right? And so if I do that, you know, that guy disappears, and now they're gonna take apart this guy, or I guess this is a woman, I'm sorry. And so as I do this, I make the image a little bit smaller. And this is, this is kind of like remove the girl, remove the guy. <laughs> so this was a pretty slick thing when it came out in 2007. And so um, here's an example of that kind of uh, scene carving for in painting. So here's the idea is let's say, okay, I want to remove. So here I'm going to take, this is the original image and this is the new image, right? These images are the same size, but to do, but I removed two books from my bookshelf, right? You look at this, you think, okay, well, nothing is really different. So what did I do? I said, okay, I want to remove these two books, the purple one and the red one, right? Now I do seam carving. I force the seams to go through those two books. So that totally removes those two guys. When I remove those seams, now I have an image that is that number of pixels smaller. And if I want to fatten it up again, I would say, okay, now I find the number of seams equivalent to the, the amount that I removed which is these guys, and I fill in pixels in those regions. Actually, now you can see that all these pixels, a lot of these guys are going through this book at the upper left that's basically just a, like a white book. When I fatten that up, that book suddenly becomes a lot wider up there in the upper corner, but you probably wouldn't really think about it, right? And so, um, so this is pretty slick. I mean, this, this is something that you could not really do with the in-painting techniques we talked about last time, right? So this is, I think, a good alternative to in-painting is something where you're not just like taking whole blocks of texture and putting them into the hole, but instead you're squeezing out the hole and expanding the image to fill in stuff. And the stuff that gets removed and added is all over the image, right? It's not just in the region of the hole. Can I ask a question? I'm just yeah. thinking about video because, you know, it works well for still images, but wouldn't that give you maybe some flicker if you didn't do it? Yes, right? so exactly. So for video, everything gets much more complicated, yeah. right? And so I think I do have a picture of, let's go to the end here. So, so this picture here is kind of like, an idea behind video seam carving. Actually, these are both for video, right? So you might imagine that if I wanted to resize a video in space and time, the, the left-hand image kind of shows me how that would work for the first algorithm we talked about, where instead of having every rectangle of the image assigned an importance, I actually assign every little three-dimensional cube space-time volume of the original video to be important. And then I can squeeze things in space and in time or both simultaneously, right? And the same thing on the left, so or on the right. So if I want to remove uh, a seam from a video, what I could do is I could find a... So if I removed a seam from every frame without really paying attention to temporal continuity, then it would definitely look pretty strange, right? If I tried to make it better by looking at the entire seam as a two-dimensional surface passing through this 3D volume and finding the lowest cost seam like that, then I could do better, right? But I will say that spatiotemporal... Spatio -temporal coherence is, again, just like with matting, the most difficult thing to deal with, right? Um, yeah. Right. Um, and, and so 
let me just say that you know one thing I thought of immediately when I heard about this stuff in the visual effects industry was you know what about like when they have to do a conversion between the widescreen movie release and the DVD release for a movie, right? There's a there's a case where you're doing aspect ratio changing. And when I was a kid, you always saw these what they call a pan and scan, right? So you, you kind of get this notion there was a guy controlling a window and he was moving that window around on the movie screen, trying to fit that into the TV, right? Um, so they don't do that as obviously anymore, but there's still kind of like you know user making decisions about how to crop or resize every scene of an image to be least um, objectionable to a TV viewer. And all that stuff is done with an eye towards what's going on. In fact, when, when someone films a movie now, what they see in their viewfinder is kind of, they see the movie aspect ratio that they're gonna have in the theater. They also probably will see the HDTV and the DVD aspect ratio superimposed on their window. So they can kind of frame up the shot in a way that they think is gonna require minimal screwing around with later on. And, and you know, some people I talked to said that, you know, movie, you know, movie frames, comp composing a movie and making it look good is like an art form. It is an art form, right? So you don't want to substitute the computer's idea for how this movie should be cropped with the person's conception of how they want to frame the stuff in the movie, right? So it's a very delicate thing to substitute the, you know, computer's idea for the human's idea. But for stuff like resizing stuff on web pages and stuff, there's no reason why this couldn't be used pretty regularly. Okay, so let me just talk about, um, you know, when things go wrong, right? So for example, here is a graffiti in uh, Japan. And so if I just did regular seam carving on this, what I would do is get something that looks weird like this. Why does it look weird? Well, you know, this guy was originally carrying the staff and now the staff has kind of been squeezed and warped. And this, this white column here looks pretty strange. And so, you know, what's happened here? Well, one of the problems with seam carving as you really squeeze down the image is that since you're removing all the low cost stuff, what you end up with is, um, you know, edges that look weird. And so I didn't say that quite the right way I watch it. So let, let me maybe write it down to guide my thoughts a little bit. So improvement to seam carving. The main one was what I would call, you know, backwards energy versus forwards energy. So backwards energy was what we talked about first, which is basically take the seam that has the lowest cost. Forwards energy is, I think, a smarter thing, and it looks better, which is basically saying, okay, so instead of just looking at the cost of this these pixels that I'm getting rid of, what I should do actually instead is to say, okay, if I were to remove this um, seam, then suddenly I'm gonna have a bunch of pixels that are neighbors that weren't neighbors before, right? And what I should do is I should measure how much, you know, have I introduced edges there that weren't there before, right? So what I could do is I could say, okay, now I wanna look at the comparison between what's happening on either side of the seam, right? What will the new neighbors look like? The idea is that I shouldn't make the new neighbors look weird. And that can happen. That's what happened in that example with the, with the Japanese graffiti. And so uh, to do that, basically, you can write an energy function that basically says, I think I've got a picture of it. So kind of here's a picture saying, OK, so the gray pixels are the candidates for what I might be removing, right? And if I remove those, then suddenly I've introduced some new neighbors, right? So if I introduce this pixel, if I remove this pixel and this pixel, suddenly I've got two new pairs of neighbors, right? That weren't neighbors before. And that's actually true in all three of these possible cases for how that seam goes through these two pixels. And so again, it's not hard to reformulate the cost function to basically add up all of these new introduced costs. Um, one thing that I didn't mention I think I'm not gonna to say too much about it for the interest of time, but one nice thing is that you can formulate the original seam carving problem, not only with dynamic programming, but also with graph cuts, right? So we talked about how graph cuts are very useful and everyone knows how to use them. Everyone's got the library, right? So you can make a graph cut version of seam carving and you can also make a graph cut version of this forward energy that turns out to work very well. And so the difference between the two images is this versus this, right? So if I do this, 
now you can see that I don't have quite the same problems I had before, right? This staff now looks pretty good. This uh, you know white wall looks pretty good. And the reason is that I'm not introducing new edges between these you know kind of high gradient regions that weren't there before. So if I compare this to this, these images are the same size, but definitely we think this one looks better, right? For example, look at this one. This guy's foot has totally been like squeezed down and here his foot looks pretty good, right? And if I compare that to the original, I could say that this is a, be a much better version of that, right? So I would say that the, the forward energy is the way to go. Okay, so that's seam carving. Com question? Here you just calculate the forward energy, right? So you throw the backwards energy out the window and you just use the forward energy, only what energy has been introduced. Because that's really, honestly, all that you should care about. That's the idea. And so basically, seam carving came out one year, and then the next year they came out with the improved seam carving, and they also addressed the video issues that we were talking about, of how do you make seam carving work pretty well for video. So yes, those papers are, are definitely a lot of fun to look at, and the accompanying videos that went to SIGGRAPH are also fun to look at. Okay, so second topic of the day is kind of, so this, this seam carving really kicked off a whole lot of people thinking about, okay, wow, we can really do some cool things with images that never had necessarily seemed possible before. You know, you might, everyone was suddenly like, oh, we can just rearrange these pixels of the image arbitrarily. Um, so the next class of methods are called patch-based methods, okay? So the idea is the following. So one thing that's bad about seam carving is that, you know, with seams, if I want to carve out this image, for example, you know, there's lots of edges all over this image, right? And so the low cost seams, after I removed a few of them, would render this image really ugly. I'm sorry I don't have an example of that, but it's definitely clear that since this image is so busy, you know, even from the very get-go, seam carving will have a hard time making a smaller image that will look any good, right? But one thing about this image that also should be striking is that this is a very repetitive image, right? There are lots of repeated elements. And so if I were to say, okay, look at this image versus this image, now these images, I guess if I showed them at the same scale, it would have been better. But these images are good in the sense that, you know, there's no stuff in this image that does not appear in this image. And conversely, I've taken all the texture from this image and represented it somewhere in this image. I'm gonna show you a better example. This is my kind of crude hand wavy thing. I'm gonna show you a video in just a second that make, makes this concept a lot easier. But the idea is to say, okay, what are the rules that we should live by, right? We, we want to live by the rules that, um, so I'm going to call these patch-based methods. And so kind of the rules to live by are, um, we don't want to introduce um, things in the retargeted image that weren't in the original. And we want to make sure everything from the original is represented in the retargeted image. Okay, and so these things are given a couple of names. So basically, um, we would call this completeness And we call this coherence. And so the idea is we want to render this new image in such a way that it is both complete and coherent. I guess I should have, I'm sorry, this image was uh, it's been smaller throughout the whole lecture. Sorry about that. Okay. And so how do I quantify um, completeness and coherence? Kind of what I want to say is, okay, um, 
see if I've got a good picture for this. Not yet. So that's like saying, okay, so if this is my original image, and this is my retargeted image, coherence says that, you know, every patch over here, every block of pixels over here should have a good match to some block of pixels over here, right? That's like saying, okay, you know, I can't have anything over in this image that did not appear somewhere over in this image. And completeness is saying that for every patch over here, I should be able to find a patch over here that looks close to that, okay? And so you might be thinking, okay, well, how does this help us with, the, with this idea? So the way this helps us is to say, okay, you know, suppose that I had a building that had, you know, columns and columns of identical windows, right? So if I wanted to do scene carving on that building, what I would probably do is I would carve out all the spaces between those windows and squeeze them down until it looked like crap, right? Whereas this would say, okay, well, you could remove a whole column of windows because if all those windows look the same, then this, neither of these criteria would be violated, right? So for example, if I had a row of building windows like this, and I turned it into this, where I remove one whole column, well, that would still be both complete and coherent, right? Because every pixel, every box I could draw around a window here would still be appearing over there and vice versa, right? The, the exploitation that we're doing is that now we can remove whole chunks of repetitive texture without incurring a big cost to the algorithm, right? So that suddenly makes everything a lot, so, so that, that suddenly broadens the perspective of what you could possibly remove from the image. Instead of removing kind of one row of pixels at a time, now I can remove like whole chunks of image at a time and still feel good about it, okay? So let's think about how do we measure these things? Okay, so let me just kind of uh, write down what the cost function is. So what I do is I make a cost function that says, the distance between image I and the retargeted version. So this is the original, and this is the retargeted. The distance between those two things is basically, well, let's suppose that I take um, N patches, um, an original image, and let's suppose I have n hat patches in the retargeted image. And again, these patches could be, you know, you know, I don't want to get into the real mud of this, but basically, you know, these are just basically square blocks of pixels. And the kind of, again, if I want to make this even better, what I should say is, I shouldn't just be looking at the same size blocks of pixels. Maybe I say, okay, you know, in I, I choose, you know, dense patches across the image that are medium size, and I, I choose also some small size patches, and I choose some big patches, right? So I want to choose patches that are multi-scale, right? That's like saying that every big chunk of texture should appear here, as well as every fine chunk of texture, right? So let's leave aside for the one how we're actually going to compute this cost function, but the idea is I generate different shapes of patches in one image and different shapes of patches in the other image. And what I want to do is I want to say, okay, so over the n patches in the original image, I want to look at the average value here. So this is basically saying, okay, if this is my patch in I, I want to find the minimum patch in I prime that minimizes some sort of distance between these two patches, right? This is kind of like saying, okay, you know, for every patch in the original, find me the closest patch over there in the retargeted and compute the distance. And that distance could be something as simple as sum of squares, right? Sum of squares distances between pixels, okay? And so this is basically saying the first term is, um, make sure I get this right. I always get this confused. So the first term is completeness, right? That's like saying that everything in the first image should appear over there in the second image. 
And then I add to that the sum over all the patches in the retargeted image. I find the closest patch in the original image, the distance between those two things. And this is the coherence. So in some sense, what we're trying to do is say, okay, if I tell you the dimensions of the image that I want to create, then I want to find the best pixels in I prime that minimize this cost function, right? Now, you can imagine this is like a crazy sort of cost function to try and minimize, right? How do I even begin to solve this problem, right? Um, well, that's where some of the magic comes in. That's where the secret sauce is. And so, um, Let's think about though, I mean, it's actually not as bad as you might think. So let's think about for a given pixel in I prime, how does it contribute to this cost function? Okay. So how does a pixel in I prime contribute to the cost function? Well, let me just show you a picture. So let's think about the top picture, right? So this is like saying, okay, this, this black pixel is the one that I care about. Now, in terms of the um, coherence term, the second term, I can think about the fact that this, this pixel here is contained in basically n squared blocks where n is the size of the block of a, at a given scale. Right? So it's like saying, okay, so suppose I'm looking at n by n blocks in this right-hand image. How many n by n blocks does this guy belong to? Well, it belongs to n squared, right? Could be in the upper left-hand corner, could be in the lower right-hand corner. And so for every one of those blocks, I would go over and I'd find the corresponding match over in the original image, and I'd pick the corresponding pixel in that location. So for example, if the pixel over here is centered in the block, then what contributes to the cost function is the difference between the black pixel here and the gray pixel here, right? And so basically it's like saying I'm comparing the color at this pixel to n squared colors over here in the left, right? So they're basically n squared terms for that part of the cost function. On the other hand, over here, if I'm looking at the completeness term, that's like saying, okay, well, I have to count up all of the, all of the patches such that the closest match to this patch over here contains the pixel that I care about. And I don't know whether or not, I don't know offhand how many of those patches there are gonna be, right? Because it could be that this guy isn't in the nearest neighbors of any of these guys over here, right? There's kind of a variable number of possibilities for how many blocks over here could match onto this pixel over here. And so while there are always n squared candidates over here, there are a variable number of candidates over here. And so if I want to write that down mathematically, that's like saying that for um, basically the coherence term, there are n squared matching pixels in I to compare. So let's call this pixel J. Uh, for the completeness term, there are, you know, let's call n sub j matching pixels in I. To compare, and this depends on how many, you know best matches of I patches contain J in I prime. You know, could be zero, could be 50, could be a thousand, you know. But ultimately then what I have is, you know, if I look back at then how does pixel J contribute to this cost function, right? 
what I would have is something like this. So pixel j's contribution would look something like, um, well, over here, I would have the sum of these n squared patches. I would look at, for example, the color, uh, sorry. I feel like I want to write this again. Pixel J's contribution. So it'd be like saying, okay, let's call these little eyes the pixels that match for the coherence term. That's just like saying, here is the color difference between those n squared pixels over in the original image and the one at the retargeted point. And then I also have some number that I don't know of, again, some other patches over in I compared with this color. I apologize, the notation for this is, is kind of hairy either way. But now what I could do is I could say, okay, so um, for a given uh, kind of, well, okay, so, so what I would say is to find the color that I want, what I would do is I would take the derivative with respect to the thing that I'm trying to set and set equals zero, right? So what I would do is I would say the, con the cost function of the whole thing is composed of a whole bunch of cost functions that look like this. How do I minimize? Well, I would take the derivative and set equal to zero, right? That produces for me some really nasty equation that involves a bunch of pixel colors from I. And you can see the formula in the book. And so the nice thing is this kind of suggests an iterative algorithm for trying to solve this problem, right? So again, how do I even make this problem tractable? Well, what I can do is I can build up the targeted image, retargeted image, kind of one cycle at a time. And so, you know, iterative algorithm is basically um, until the retargeted image stops changing, what I could do is basically say for each patch in the retargeted image, find the best match in I, right? That gives me basically the colors I need for the coherence term. And then for each patch in I, find the best match in the retargeted image. That gives me the pixels for the completeness term. And then I update I prime using these kind of temporary best batches. And so basically what I would do, and there, there's more details in the original paper, but I would initialize with a, you know, uh, basically uniformly scaled version of the original. So again, there's definitely some secret sauce in how do you make this whole process work. Part of it is that, you know, so say I want to resize an image from something like this down to here, what I would do is I would initially maybe make the image 90% smaller in both dimensions. Then I would see the retarget image of that algorithm, let it reshuffle its patches to 
achieve you know, an equilibrium. Then I would make the image a little bit smaller and reshuffle it again. So basically, this proceeds in the kind of this big, big iterative process. And so you could imagine that this whole thing could potentially take forever. I mean, like, it could take a very, very long time. I mean, it produces very good results. The original paper by Simikov et al., like, you looked at these images, you were like, wow, you know, this is really striking, the, the, the things that you can do with this algorithm. I'm going to show you some examples in just a second. Um, but the problem is that it was way, way slow. Even for, you know, for, for relatively small images, it was still pretty slow. And so uh, we talked, you know, you were saying last time, patch match. So what is patch match? Patch match is an algorithm that came on the scene a year or two after the original. So I should have, I should have said that this algorithm overall is called bidirectional similarity. This kind of algorithm or approach is called bidirectional similarity. Sometimes you hear this called BDS, and this was by Simikov et al. But it's super slow. So so basically, the whole thing was really made tractable by an algorithm called patch match. And this was by Barnes et al. So patch match was not really necessarily so much of a new um, a new algorithm per se, it was an algorithm for really speeding up all of these patch to patch nearest neighbor computations that you had to do, right? So a key part of the whole process, right, is continually searching for patches from one image that match the other image over and over again, right? And so that's the part that really is the computational bottleneck in this whole thing. And so these guys who were at Princeton had to, they basically figured out a way to make that multiple patch to patch comparison algorithm much, much, much more efficient with kind of, and that, that was almost more of like a data structures idea than it was a computer vision idea. The patch to patch algorithm as a core didn't really have that much to do with computer vision, but they used it to speed up all these computer vision algorithms. And so um, the result suddenly made things work. And so let me show you the uh, you know, patch match video. So here's an example basically of, if I want to retarget this image, right? I'm gonna make this a little bigger. So if I wanna retarget this image, well, seam carving would do a bad job of squeezing this out, but as you'll see, I can retarget this image by removing whole columns of windows, right? So what happened here? Well, let's take a look at this for a second. So before, there were four yellow columns, and after the retargeting, there were three, right? And so, you know, this removed an entire column of windows. Now, I'm voicing over the video myself to explain it to you, but basically you can see there's still some things wrong with this, right? You can see there's this big, weird, uh, you know, broken line here. And so one of the other innovations about patch match had to do with um, doing this in a way that you could manually annotate, hey, there's some stuff here that you have to preserve, right? You have to make sure that these straight lines remain straight in the composite. And that has to do with kind of like, that, that in turn puts a constraint on where the patches from the old image can come from in the new image, right? So that's kind of like saying, you could even imagine it's like saying you fix. Okay, so here's an example of, you know, here's an example of how seam carving can go wrong. This image is just way too edgy, right? And so there were some things about, you know, uh, even if you constrain some things, here, here's how they do it for their image. So here's what they're gonna do. They're gonna draw all these parallel lines and they're gonna say, keep this kid, make sure he doesn't get, you know, squeezed apart. And when they do that, they end up with this image. And so what you can see here is that the kid has been preserved. And if you compare that to the original, what has been changed? Well, a lot of the repetitive bottles and stuff have been condensed down, right? So for example, if you look at the original image, look at all these, you know, fused bottles here, right? There are like 10 of these bottles. And so in the resulting image, there's only like five of these bottles, right? 
And that's okay because we've captured the spirit of having those bottles in the image, right? We haven't really lost anything by removing a bunch of bottles that all look the same, right? Mm. Another thing that's really exciting about this is that, so what they do here, they basically outline the kid and said, this kid has to stay in the image somewhere as this you know, form. But now there's something that, that prevents you from saying, okay, well, what if I want to actually move stuff around in the image, right? So I could say, okay, well, I want to have the kid in the image, but I want to move him somewhere that he didn't originally exist. That's just like saying, okay, well, I'm fixing all that chunk of the retargeted image, and now all the other pixels around that region have to work hard to minimize the bidirectional similarity to make sure that I've got as low a cost as possible, right? So it's all about kind of like saying, okay, I'm fixing some constraints in the retargeted image by either specifying pixels that need to be there or lines that need to be there. And so here's an example of what you call reshuffling. So here they can say, okay, I'm gonna cut this part out and I wanna make it appear now over here, right? And all the other pixels in the image have to follow along, right? To minimize the bidirectional similarity. And so this is what you would call image reshuffling. And again, you could definitely talk about whether or not, so here they're saying, okay, move this girl over here. You do that and first they are putting in the constraint that that line has to be straight. You put the girl over there and the reshuffled image looks pretty good, right? Now they're saying, okay, well, there's this chain left over from when I removed that girl. Now you can use the same kind of idea about like the same as we talked about how seam carving, you could have the seams passing through regions that you want to inpaint. The same thing applies here. You can say, okay, you cannot take, so, so this region of the image basically is saying, okay, you know, I want to remove this stuff. None of this stuff can appear in the final composite. And so they can apply inpainting algorithms. And again, it just kind of like vanishes, right? It's like magic. And so I believe that some portions of this have made into the most recent version of Photoshop. I mean, look at this. This is like kind of suddenly you're making these kind of, you're, you're taking this thing, you're doubling it, you're putting it somewhere else. I mean, like you're totally remixing what the original image looked like and you're forcing all the other pixels to kind of play along to look as good as possible. So like, again, if you look at the final image, uh, it goes by too fast. All right, well, I can't put my thumb right on it, so. If you hit the space bar while it's playing, you might be able to pause it. Oh, yeah, you're right. Okay, so then here, basically, again, this is not coalesced into the final image, but what's happening is that, for example, all of this kind of adjoining texture is being forced to play along to be as consistent as possible with the original image, right? And so this whole approach allows for some really wild, you know, retargeting, reshuffling. Um, so I believe, like I said, that, that there are parts of this, what they would call content-aware resizing inside Photoshop CS6, at least, maybe in the newest Photoshop version. I'm not exactly sure how much, I, I, don't, know, I don't know if the interface looks exactly like this, um, but I believe that if you look in, <coughs> under the hood of Photoshop, you'll see that the patch match algorithm of finding fast nearest neighbors to do this kind of image editing is definitely now part of the Photoshop way of doing things. Um, so it's pretty slick. And this is just an example of reshuffling I did myself. Kind of, I will say that at the time that I was writing about this, that there really was no publicly available version of reshuffling a bidirectional similarity accelerated by patch match that worked really well. And so, you know, my caveat is that I personally had a hard time, with, you know, three years ago when I wrote the book and made the figures, making this work as well as, as this demo made it look, right? But now there may be stuff out there that makes it quite this easy. So I encourage you to see if you can find something that, that actually fulfills the promise of this video. I would love to see an executable running on somebody's computer here where it actually works like that. So if you have something that actually comes together like that, I would love to see it. Um, okay. And so, what else do I want to say here? So we talked a lot about different ways of resizing an image. And again, there's not necessarily any um, downside to applying multiple versions or multiple iterations of these things, mixing and matching them, right? So for example, if I wanted to resize an image, maybe I might do a couple steps of scale and stretch resizing. The first thing we talked about, I might do a couple steps of seam carving, I might do a couple steps of patch match. And so there have been some perceptual studies that you can read about in the book about you know, 
the best order of things to produce images that align as well as possible with what people think images should look like. And so, um, you know, that's, that's actually pretty interesting stuff perceptually. Um, we only touched on briefly this idea of video, you know, retargeting, and that is a much harder problem. Um, you know, video retargeting in general is, um, you know, there are some good things about it and there are some bad things about it, right? So, suppose I wanted to retarget a video of kind of a person and they were, you know, walking behind a tree, for example. So, let's suppose that I wanted to, um, what would be a good example? Mm, can I think of it? So, let's suppose I wanted to remove the person, right? So, if I wanted to remove the person, then life would not be so bad because instead of having to treat every frame as an independent image and inpaint this hole, what I could do is I could say, okay, well, I'm just going to wait until that person moves off over here. And then I could say, well, if the camera hasn't moved, I can just basically steal these pixels and put them over here into that hole, right? So instead of having to do inpainting along the lines of what we talked about last time, where I'm having to steal images or steal pixels from the very same frame, well, I should be able to steal pixels further down the sequence where I had effectively exactly the texture that I want, right? And so this kind of idea is used in visual effects all the time when if they need to repaint something behind a person, they just hope that there's another image of that scene that they can stack in the texture. And so it's also more, more complicated when the camera is moving, right? So if the camera has moved and this region of, of pixels doesn't look exactly like what it should to fit behind that person, well, then we'll talk about stuff like in chapters like six and eight about how you can use 3D geometry to help you warp back the texture to appear the right way from the camera perspective of the image that you care about, right? So in that sense, you know, life is good. Um, but for example, if I wanted to remove the tree from the image, right? Now that would be a much harder problem because, you know, maybe I could, you know, I suppose this was grassy and stuff. Maybe I could inpaint the tree you know, what's behind the tree with grass, and that would look okay. But here I would have to kind of hallucinate what was the person doing behind the tree, right? And that would be a much harder problem, right? So for that, what I might have to do is, for example, look at the periodicity of their walk cycle and try and say, okay, I'm going to try and continue that walk cycle through the tree and steal video frames or chunks of pixels from the corresponding images of the walk cycle to put behind the tree. That becomes a much harder problem, right? These are the kinds of things where if you need to do this in real life, you would try to record the original video in such a way that you didn't have to hallucinate so much stuff after the fact, right? Um, okay, so again, just like last time, you know, now that you've read about this stuff on uh, image inpainting, image retargeting, you know, the industry perspective section of the book should be an interesting read to talk about how does this compare against what people are actually doing in Hollywood, because they're solving a lot of the same problems, but they're not necessarily solving them in the same way. Uh, and with that, I'll pause and ask any questions. Yes? Uh, so if you have, like, time information, yeah. Yeah. Yes, so the question is, just for the purpose of the microphone, so the question is if you have a moving camera and you want to use that, can, can you use the camera motion information to steal pixels? And that's exactly what happens. Basically what you do is you'd estimate the optical flow between the images and you'd use those optical flow vectors to know what pixels of the you know video down the road should be taken to put back into the video at this frame, right? So definitely those flow vectors play a big role in warping the texture back into the right place. Yeah, so we'll talk about that in chapter five. Okay, so with that, I'm going to stop the recording, if I can figure out how, which I never seem to be able to do. Ah, why do I suck? <laughs>